We want it to sound like something that nobody's ever heard before. We want to bring the audience in the center of the orchestra and just wow them with how clear it is and how incredible it is. But also realizing we're in a 600 year old cathedral that could have pigeons and could have, you know, all sorts of noises happening that we just wouldn't be able to control. Hi everyone, today's guest on We Need to Talk About Oscar has worked on films like La La Land, the film that is tied with Titanic and All About Eve for the most Oscar nominations ever, or Ford v Ferrari, Little Miss Sunshine, Babylon, and of course Bradley Cooper's directorial debut, 2018's A Star is Born, which is a great segue to the film that's the reason for us talking today, Mr. Cooper's second directing gig, Maestro. Please welcome four-time Academy Award-nominated sound mixer, Steve Morrow. Hello, Steve. Thanks for having me. We usually start our interviews by asking our guests about their core memories that either made them fall in love with films in general or made them go, yeah, well, I'm going to be a filmmaker. So how about you? Yeah, I mean... um... I think, you know, my, my love for movies have, as far as I can remember, uh, we always watch movies with my dad. Um, uh, we'd have movie nights. Um, and from the time I, I mean, I, I feel like I remember from the time I was eight years old, I knew that, you know, I'm going to make movies for a living. That's what I want to do. I wasn't sure what I wanted to do exactly. I always thought I wanted to be a director and it turns out, you know, once you watch what the majority of directors have to kind of put up with or deal with, um, I was like, nah, you know, yes, you want to be a director, like a, a Steven Spielberg director. You don't want to be like the, the guy who's made his fourth film and still has to direct by committee or, or have to beg for money and things like that, where it's just like, ah, that doesn't seem fun for me. Um, so yeah, when I was young, that was it. My parents, you know, my parents were divorced. My mom remarried and we moved to California. And at eight years old, I got to watch them make movies across the street at the park um, you know, movies, TV shows, anything. And I just, I was just mem- mesmerized by what they were doing, you know, what, what was happening and just kind of the magic of, of making movies and TV. And I thought that's something that I, I'm definitely going to do that. That's what I want to do. And, uh, especially that sound mixing to the general audience seems, or no pun intended, sounds like, I'm not saying gibberish, but such an oddly specific line of uh, work in filmmaking that they aren't really familiar with, while I think we all know that it's a quite essential part of the process. Of course, film history includes a great bunch of wonderful silent films, but that's just not how we roll nowadays, I would say. Yeah, no, I mean, it's a, the production sound mixer's job. That's that's the job I do. We're essentially in charge of recording the actors while they're, while they're acting in front of camera. So our main goal is the dialogue of the movie, uh, capturing it in a way that's, that's obviously usable. You know, the majority of, of work that you do is, is going to be used. And the goal is to capture the performances of the actors while they're in character. Because if you have to go re-record you know, or, or do ADR six months later, you have an issue that, you know, the actor has been out of that. They may have done two other movies since then. So to capture that voice or capture that performance again is tough, you know, months later. So the goal is always to get it the best you can on set, you know, so that you don't have to do any of that post work, you know, that you can just, you can use that as the performance of the film. So if you think about it, it's where the center channel of the movie, you know, the middle of the, yeah. that's where the dialogue comes from. You worked on the previous three listed great titles, and I could have easily said a dozen more, but uh, we know what level of a passion project this was for Bradley. How did this come across to you by working on it? Yeah, I mean, this is actually a a passion project, I think, for most of us. Um, You know, when we did A Star is Born, you know, he that was his first movie that he directed. 
and his crew, you know, we all, we've all worked together before and we've worked together since on other projects, but his crew really, you know, he really has the ability to have a passion for what he's, what the story he's telling and that it's infectious. You know, you want to be part of that excitement and you want to be part of that passion. So, you know, you have no choice, but to get on a train or, or stay behind, you know, that that's pretty much what it is. Um, so once the star is born was done, he started talking about, you know, his next film and, uh, Bernstein came up as a, as an idea that he wanted to do And him and I did the meal together, which was a Clint Eastwood movie. And at the time that we were doing that, he was researching it. Uh, so we had a lot of time to talk about what his goals were for, uh, Maestro. And it was one of those things where it's like, okay, you know, stars born, we did all the vocals live. We did some of the music live, but mostly it was all the vocals for all the, all the music. <clears throat> and he wanted, he's like, you know, let's do, let's do the orchestra live. Let's try that. You know, let's do something. Cause it, it works so well on a, a star is born that he just wanted it to be, you know, let's try it again. Let's, let's do the same, uh, live performance, but only with an orchestra. <laughs> it's like, you know, that is a, like sounded incredibly, um, insane. Actually, it was just like, Oh my gosh, that's going to be so much work and that's going to be so hard. And I wonder if we can even do it. Can it be pulled off? You know, cause in the middle of making a movie, there's cameras moving and there's people moving and trying to record an orchestra. And then their silences are, is difficult on a good day, you know? So it's like add a film crew on top of it and becomes impossible. But but his passion, like I said, is infectious. And so you want to, you want to try it. You want to push the boundaries and, and see if you can get to that next, um, you know, level of, of capturing a performance and, 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 uh, we were able to pull it off. And did it being a passion project, make your general work and work experience in any ways different from your previous ones? And, uh, was there any feel of additional pressure thanks to this? I mean, it's just like anything else, you know, it's like if you work for somebody who has a passion for what they do, you know, you have to step up your work. And if you work for somebody who just kind of doesn't really care, just wants to move along with the day, then that's kind of how you're going to be, too. You know, it's a it's a thing that I think is is goes across most professions that you want to work with somebody who's inspired and wants to be there. And then that allows you to want to be there, you know, so. Yeah, I mean, I've worked with directors who, you know, treat it like that it's just a day job and they just want to get through the day and move on. And that's fine. You know, some some movies are not, you know, cinematic masterpieces. Some movies are just product to get people to to, you know, watch TV or whatever. So it's like, you know, I've always said to a certain degree, you know, being a film crew person is like being an assembly line worker at a car factory at the end of the day we're all making cars and the question is do you want to make like the ford fiesta which is a totally fine car gets you from point a to point b or do you want to make a ferrari hand built cared for crafted for but at the end of the day it's still getting you from point a to point b you're not solving cancer with it but you're making something that people are you know love and are passionate about and so you know you can con kind of treat it that way where you just go, okay, you know, I want to be on the Ford or I want to be on the Ferrari assembly line. I want to make these beautiful cars that people love. And so that's, <clears throat> that's kind of how I see it where it's like, you know, yes, we're making, we're making movies, you know, we're making entertainment, but do you want to make something that you're really passionate about that you care about that people are going to enjoy? Or do you just want to make content, you know, for the next, you know, click or, or whatever the next view. So it is fun to be part of a project where you can can be inspired. But yes, that also adds, you know, complexity of pressure and, um, you know, you, it's self-imposed pressure. You know, we we definitely want to make sure we were getting it right because you have such, you know, leadership knowing exactly what he wants every single day. And you want to make sure that you're delivering that and you don't want to be the the loose, you know, the, the thing that's holding everything back. So, yeah, you, you do a lot of I mean, we thought about this movie for three years and we actually got an extra year to prep it because COVID obviously hit and there was a moment in our industry where you couldn't have um, musicians playing near each other without shields and all sorts of stuff. So you couldn't put an orchestra together and have them play live. Uh, and so we, you know, Bradley put the movie on hold for a year so that we could, could record that live. So yeah, there was, there was a lot of added pressure. As you said, uh, your main goal and role or job is getting the dialogues. 
but this film where music plays such a central such a visceral role additionally to the orchestra which obviously we can just take out of the equation does this uh, require more or different sound work than i don't know yeah. usually yeah i mean the usual thing is you know you're you're just recording the dialogue and the 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 actors this time anytime you see something being played on screen musically or or even you know a choir singing on screen that's all being recorded live while we're filming it and there's multiple ways of doing it you know on for the small things we do um you know like uh, the first day of shooting was um him Lenny teaching the uh the class on how to conduct you know, it just happens at the end of the film yeah and um that we did with I want to say we did with 10 microphones and it was me and Nick Baxter uh, or Nick Baxter and I, I guess that's a better way to say it. Um, And him and I have worked on La La Land together and he's a music supervisor. He actually was a music producer on The Color Purple, the new movie that just came out. And, um, you know, him and I collaborate all the time. And so, you know, we came up with a plan for that. And then we relied on the the house crew, the crew that works at uh, Tanglewood, to hang the mics, we'd say, here's where we want it. And they're like, yeah, no problem. They have the system down and they, they hang it and we bring all the stuff in and, and set it up. And then you have a, a scene like Ely Cathedral where we have 60 microphones hung, you know, from a 600 year old church from the, from most of it from up above. I mean, the logistics. Yeah. The logistics are, are, are huge on that. But what we, what we do is you lean on the best the best ideas that come forward, you know, we have years to think about it and London symphony orchestra is like, Hey, why don't you talk to our house team, which is classic sound in London. And they've mic'd the Ely cathedral before for other performances. And maybe they have an idea and we went, this is a great idea. Let's talk to them. They've done it. And they say, okay, well, here's what we normally do. And we go, that's great. But what we want to do is, is much bigger because of Dolby Atmos, because of the theatrical release, because we want it to sound like something that nobody's ever heard before. We want to bring the audience in the center of the orchestra and just, just wow them with how clear it is and how incredible it is. But also realizing we're in a 600 year old cathedral that could have pigeons and could have, you know, all sorts of noises happening that we just wouldn't be able to control. So we leaned on them and they said, yeah, we can, we can mic the orchestra. And then we said, you know, we mapped it out and said, here's what we would like. Here's how we want it done. And they, and they would have their suggestions and we would have ours and we'd go back and forth and then we'd settle in the middle. So yeah, there we're, but, but to answer your question, yeah, we're responsible mostly for the dialogue on a normal film, but this film, we, you know, are put into a role where I'm in charge on set to make sure everything runs smooth, but you can delegate things out, you know, Hey, classic sound, how much time do you need? Oh, you need two days before the performance. Okay. You know, and they go back to production. Okay. We need two days before the performance. And, you know, on a film like this, they're very good at going, okay, yep, we understand. And let's give them two days. And, you know, it's not a, oh, we don't have money for that. It's like, no, no, no. You, if you want it done, you have to do it this way. But which is nice because we also have that uh, shorthand from Stars Born. You know, it was, we, I remember on the Stars Born, uh, the first AD who's responsible for the running of the, the movie set, you know, we're on the tech scout. And the first day that we're going to be at Coachella, which is a big music venue in the desert in um, California, you know, we're going to move from one stage to another stage about a mile away. So it means we have to break everything down, put it on a truck and drive it a mile away, set it all back up and have it ready to record again. And this was going to be on the first day of shooting. And I said, well, we're going to need three hours to set it up in the morning. So we'll need to come in at 4 a.m., start setting it up. We'll be ready by 7 You can shoot. And then when you break for lunch at 1 p.m., you shouldn't break us for lunch. We should tear everything down. It's going to take us about an hour and a half to take it all down, put it on a truck, drive it a mile away, three hours to put it back up. And you can't be filming anything while we're doing it, you know, because it's going to take all my whole team. So it's about a four and a half hour downtime. And then we'll be ready to shoot the night scene on the next stage. And I said, so, you know, it's a four and a half hour period of the day where you're just kind of going to be standing there waiting for us and you'll you'll be lighting or doing whatever you want to do in between, you know, and and on previous experiences I've always had where the 
production goes, well, okay, but we can give you like an hour. You know, <laughs> just like, no, there's not. Or, you know, or they say, well, can we, can we double the package? Can we just rent a whole nother package? And it's like, no, not really. You know, you can't really, you can, but you can't, you know, not on the budget we're working on. We kind of have to deal with what we're dealing with. So, you know, they were good about listening. And then on the day that we filmed, sure enough, you know, okay, everybody's breaking for lunch. Okay, sound, you stay behind, you know, and we got our four and a half hours and we moved stages and we set it all back up. And then, then we filmed and then we wrapped and by two in the morning we were done and we had a 22 hour day on sound that we never broke for lunch, but it was like, this is the requirement for this day of shooting and product understood it. And we were good about communicating it and they were good about giving it to us. And so we had the same, uh, first AD, uh, the same, uh, you know, AD department on this movie. And we, we just said, here's what we need to accomplish these goals. And they said, no problem, you know, cause we have that understanding from previous work that we have all done together. So it's, yeah, I mean, it's, it's logistically difficult, but if you have the right team in place, then everybody understands what the goal is and and everybody works for the same goal. And as far as I know, the cathedral scene or sequence, uh, there were multiple unsuccessful tries and then it was filmed kind of impromptu. Yeah. So when you shoot a scene like that, so our movie, we shot most of the movie, 99% of the movie before that day of filming at the Ely Cathedral. So that day was pretty much our last day of filming. And what we did is we filmed the movie like you see it, a bunch of one shots and a bunch of wides and a bunch of things. And then when we went into the Ely Cathedral and you have 200 musicians and you have this beautiful song, you know, I think Bradley got a little nervous about how he was going to be able to conduct it. Was he going to be able to look realistic? So let's have a lot of footage where you can cut away to other things, you know, traditional filmmaking, three cameras, you know, a bunch of different shots and film it that way. And then that way, no matter what you have the scene, because this is, by the way, a very expensive scene when you have live musicians being recorded, every minute they're recorded is a certain amount of money. So you had to get it right. And he didn't want to like, you know, spend all this time and effort and money and then not have anything to use. But he went after the first day of filming. I mean, we did, you know, a dozen or so takes after the first day of filming, you know, Bradley has a very good intuition about, he has a good way of listening to himself and going, I don't think I have that. It doesn't feel like I've had it right. You know, and there's something that just kind of scratches the back of his head, back of his brain. And he's got to like, think about it. And then he came in the next day and said, you know, I know we're supposed to shoot this night exterior. I I just want to shoot the musicians again. I just want to do it again. And, uh, I want to do it in one long take, like we've done the rest of the movie and him and mango, James Mang mangoes, his nickname, he's the dolly grip, uh, and Maddie Labatique, the cinematographer, and they all planned it out. You know, here's, here's, here's the length of the song. And and Mango's very good at, you know, he, he has the song he's listening to, he's got earphones on, he's practicing the move. And they, they spent about two and a half hours setting up the shot you know, to go back and in and then just end right over Felicia's shoulder right at the end of the song. And that was, I think we only did two takes. I feel like we only did two takes of it, but that was it. I mean, that was, that's what's in the movie. And then after we did that, we did the shot of the violinist really, you know, going for it. And the, the, the guy hitting the, uh, you know, the, the timpani player or whatever, but it's like, um, for the most part, that entire shot, was on the second day he just wanted to do it again because he just didn't feel it was real the first day and sure enough that he was right you know the first day didn't feel real he wasn't hitting every moment of conducting you know even the the london symphony orchestra who are not going to pull punches said yeah the first day was crap but what you just did on that wide you know on that one shot is perfect like that's the one that's that's where you were conducting us period the first day we were just playing and then today we were being conducted. So yeah, he's good at, at, you know, listening to his own intuition and, and deciding whether he has it or not. And that meeting when something isn't right or just not up to par. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, it's just, it's everything. It's like, you know, the, the, if you think about the um, Thanksgiving day scene or the Snoopy scene, you know, where they're arguing that scene was supposed to take two days to film and it was going to be the big argument. And then we're going to, you know, shoot the wide shot that's in the movie and then go in for a bunch of coverage like you would do on a normal film. And after we did the first two takes and she's sitting in the chair for the first two takes 
And then on the third take, he goes, actually, why don't you s- stand up and sit into the uh, window seat? You know, just sit in the window seat. Let's try it again. And we shot that take. And then we cut and he goes, I think that's it. I don't think we have to shoot anymore. And, you know, let me see playback. And he play it back and he'd watch it. And he'd go, okay, yeah, that's it. We're going home. And it was like, you know, we shot that scene in three takes, you know, no coverage. And you watch the movie and it's a memorable scene because of that, you know? And it's like, that originally was planned for a bunch of coverage. And then he was like, you know what? No, I just want to, I just want to be a fly on the wall for this conversation and let the audience just just sit there and watch it. And so, you know, those are the things that his instincts really take over and he's got great instincts. And so you have to be prepared as a crew. You know, if you sat back and were like, oh, we'll get all the dialogue and coverage. This is just a wide shot. doesn't matter. We'd be dead wrong. You know, you have to be prepared for every single shot to, to matter to the degree that it does. One of the many things this film does very well is the range in which it delivers from the calmest, most quiet and intimate moments to the loudest ones. On one hand, we have, just to highlight the most obvious one, the already many times uh, mentioned cathedral scene, while on the other hand, there are times when we can only hear the sounds of nature and see those intimate moments that Lenny and Felicia share at the start or at least in the early days of their relationship and later on in a pretty similar setting after she's diagnosed with cancer or when they are lying on the bed with Lenny mm-hmm. curling up to Felicia from behind, hugging her and all we can hear are their breath sighs as they share one of their final moments together. When the focus is so much on, uh, in one case, on these loud big moments and in the other on the calmness and the nuances of both the performances the actors give and just as I said, the natural sounds coming from their surrounding, how do you find your focus? Yeah, no, I think, I think the movie has to breathe in moments. I mean, the the movie is a very, the sound mix on this is very delicate. You're living a lot of the movie with just the dialogue tracks and then some, some ambient tracks playing, you know, there's not a lot of music underscore that, you know, covers up, uh, you know, the edits or covers up any kind of noisy sets, those things. So you have to be very purposeful in what you're picking to, to let the audience hear, you know, are you hearing wind? Are you hearing birds chirping? Are you hearing, you know, what type of bird is it? What type of wind is it? Is it strong? Is it, you know, these are all really specific things that are chosen for those scenes because the dialogue is hanging out on a ledge, you know, for everybody to see it. And if you're not treating it in a delicate way, you can either overdo it or underdo it and you throw the audience out. I mean, the, the goal is always to, keep the audience engaged, keep them not, you know, you don't want them to realize they're watching a movie, right? As soon as they go, oh, there's a trick here, you know, you're thrown out of the movie and then that's it. You know, I think that's also why the big moments happen and the big moments really are effective because it doesn't feel like a trick. Another big part of this movie is the dialogue when you're in these party scenes. I I did a movie called um, Front Runner with Jason Reitman years ago. And we did this technique on that movie where we mic'd everybody and had everybody talk and whatever the camera's looking at is kind of what we're hearing. And Bradley saw the movie and said, why does that sound so real versus other movies where you just hear people, you know, wall to wall in the background and there's, there's loop groups that are faking it. And I said, well, it's because it's real. You have to mic everybody and you have to spend a lot of time and effort to do that. But if you can do it right, have everybody in the party talk like it's a regular party and, and make sure that they're in the right era so that you can use all the audio, then you'll, we've all been at a party before. We all know what it sounds like. And so when you're trying to fake that sound, it's very obvious to everybody, but if you can capture it in a way that is usable and then you can play it in the theater, then that's like, that's the, that's the magic of just, you know, we're, we're not tricking the audience anymore. We're actually just putting them in a place that they've been in plenty of times. And so then they're more comfortable and they're more engaged in the party. And that was how we treated all those scenes. Anytime there's a, just a bunch of people talking, we just have a bunch of people talking. It's logistically harder than just having everybody be quiet and just having the actors talk. But it gives you the realism that 
the audience is sophisticated enough to know. I mean, we all we've all been at a party and we know what those sound like. And so, you know, to be able to talk over all the party is is kind of the goal in making it noisy. You know, you want it to be noisy. You want to hear the dialogue. And, and if you can't hear if you can't hear that actor, they need to speak up, you know, <laughs> like it's you're at a party. So just treat it real. Those are the things that we always try to keep in mind, knowing that, you know, in the theater, when you're watching this, how do you want this party to sound? Do you want this to be loud and noisy? Because if it is, you you know, everybody should be very loud. If this is a, a jazzy, you know, four hours later in a party and everybody's quiet, then that's how it's going to be. So it's always a matter of um, just making sure that you're you're aware of what the audience is going to be feeling at this moment and how to how to delicately treat it. You know, do you want it to be these silent, quiet moments where just the wind is heard, or do you want it to be a loud party or, you know, or the orchestra? So those are the the, the key balances to to play around with. And, and you also need a, a little bit of breath from the loud to the quiet. You need the audience to not be overwhelmed. You know, I think we've all watched like, you know, an action movie that just has a great sequence that's 20 minutes long. And by the end of it, you're exhausted. You're just like, yeah. okay, or even halfway through it, you lose interest because it's just too much. Yeah, it happens. And it's just, that's the key to just make sure you don't lose the audience. I'm so glad that you mentioned your collaboration with uh, Jason Reitman, because uh, just today I was scrolling through your IMDb page and so that uh, you worked on or are working on to hopefully 2024 releases. Todd Phillips is follow up to 2019's Big Hit Joker, titled Joker Folia 2, and uh, Clint Eastwood's. Uh, Wow. <laughs> Juror number two. Um, yeah. These these two are listed to be in post-production. And then if all goes as planned, next year we'll get to see Jason Reitman's SNL 1975 for the 50th anniversary of, of course, Saturday Night Live. First yeah. of all, just a little comment. Steve, yeah. you are one busy man. <laughs> I, I, you know, I like, you know, it's, it's helpful to love what you do for a living. And I absolutely love it. And, um, you know, it's a, it's a great life. It's a tough life, but I do find a lot of enjoyment doing it. And I just, uh, I hope I get to do it for the next, you know, 20 years. Um, cause I just have such a great time doing it and, and I love the people I work with and, and the, the job is fun and it is hard, you know, when you're working 12 hours a day, five days a week, uh, minimums, sometimes 22 a day. Oh yeah. Sometimes one or two a day, but yeah, I mean, these are things where you just have to, if you don't love it, don't do it, you know, cause you're going to be miserable. It's just like anything else in life. It's if you have other options that you think you'd like better, go for those. That's, you just have to bring the passion every day. And if it's, if it's a drag on you or if it, you just can't do it, I don't know. I don't know how people do it if they don't love it. So I love it. <laughs> And my final question, as we are wrapping things up, uh, a, a rather big one, I'm, I'm not going to let you go, DZ. Uh, you've worked with some of their generation's greatest filmmakers and uh, some of the all-time greats as well. Mm -hmm. I'd like to get their perspective on this as well, but now I want to ask you, what do you think makes you all these visionary directors go to collaborator other than being really good at your job? Our business, like I said, is is you do so many hours with people that if you're not easy to be around, basically you want to you want to make you know you collaborate with people that you respect, but also that you get along with. You know, if you don't, if you're not an easy person to to collaborate with, then nobody wants to nobody wants to give you the time of day. And so for me, it's always been a goal to um, be as positive as possible, but also be engaged. You know, my, my job can technically on some movies be definitely just a technician job. You know, I'm recording the dialogue. That's it. A to B that's, that's it. But there's other movies and other directors that want more out of their sound department and realize that if they're asking more of us, it's because it's, there's a, there's a, a bit of an art form there. And if they can get in early enough to really collaborate and get the idea, like, like Jason Reitman, and like Bradley Cooper, you know, these are guys that, and Todd Phillips also, that just want to, it's not just about getting the cleanest dialogue and that's it. It's about what can you, what else can you bring to this movie? What else can you, you know, elevate in the, the storytelling process? And uh, to me, that's exciting. I mean, there's, there's always going to be movies where it's just about the dialogue and that's totally fine too. There's not, there's no issues with that, but there are some movies where you can really bring a lot more to the storytelling as long as you are allowed to, you know? And so 
being able to be allowed to is also just, you know, do you get along with people? Do people get along with you? Are you easy to talk to? Or, you know, do you have a point in what you're asking for or, or saying, here's what I think we should do it this way. And if you're, if you're just talking to talk, then it's not really worth anybody's time. But if you actually have a, a good idea, then, you know, it, it can work out in the benefit for the movie in general. So that's, that's always my, my goal is just to lighten the spirit on the set and also, you know, get something that maybe the director wasn't thinking about that could be done on the production side. You know, when you can suggest, hey, we can do it this way, you know, or if you want, I can play that sound effect off camera, you know, just to, to cue the actors or, you know, so, you know, something that's simple that I can do that the director hadn't thought about doing because, you know, oh, I'll just do that in post and we'll just have the script supervisor say, look, you know, and then it's like, are you getting the best performance that way? You know, but also when you provide that additional idea, you have to be able to execute it fast because time is money. You know, so you have to make sure that you yeah. can deliver on the promises you're making without it being a, a costly decision. Yeah. You just got to love it. You know, you just got to love it. <laughs> well, Steve, thank you so much for taking the time, especially on a Sunday morning. Oh, absolutely. It's my pleasure. I really hope we can talk soon regarding your future projects. Yeah, let's do it. Yeah. I mean, like you said, there's a couple coming out this year. I'm sure Joker will be something that we can uh, really dive into once once the movies come out, or at least once they allow us to talk about it. Yeah. Um, that's going to be an exciting sound film. So look forward to that one. And, and SNL as well. You know, Jason has some really great ideas about what we're going to do. You know, we're going to do a lot of actors, a lot of days, 20, 30 actors a day, mic'd up and talking in, in a scene together. You know, it's like, it's going to be big. So it'll, it'll be fun to talk about that. That'll be a lot to do. <laughs> yeah. Thank you once Thank again. Thank you so much. 